I want to tell you about how we think about investing. Nobody can provide a rule that will work all the time. The best we can do is to supply a way of thinking that works most of the time. Our job as investors is to do a superior job. If we do an average job, we don't add any value. Our superiority comes from having a good return earned with the risks under control. Superior investing, that's what it's all about. Everything that an investor does falls under one of two headings. Not everybody has organized the process this way. This is how I think of it. Number one, asset selection. Owning more of the things that do well and less of the things that do poorly. Number two, cyclical positioning. Having more invested more aggressively when the times are right and less invested more defensively when the times are wrong. In other words, fluctuating between offense and defense. The choice at any given time between offense and defense is the most important choice that an investor makes. The question is not U.S. versus foreign, stocks versus bonds, small cap versus large, value versus growth. The most important thing is whether to be aggressive or defensive at a point in time. If you can get that right, all the other things fall in line. And if you get that wrong, the rest won't help. Offense versus defense. Now the question, how do we figure out whether to be aggressive or defensive? That's really the key. In my opinion, the question is best answered through an understanding of where we stand in the cycle. I should make clear at the very outset that I don't believe in forecasts. It's one of the important six tenets of Oak Tree's investment philosophy is that we do not determine our investment actions on the basis of macro predictions, economy, market, rates, currencies. Nobody, in my opinion, knows consistently more about those things than anybody else. The way to understand the cycles is by uh, remembering what Mark Twain is supposed to have said. History does not repeat, but it does rhyme. What does that mean? It means that the specifics of cycles, the amplitude, the frequency, the speed of the fluctuations, the duration of a cycle, this varies from one to the other. These things are not consistent enough that we can use rules and measurements and regularity to tell us how to behave. Also, the cause and the effect of every cycle differ. So there is no specific uh, cause that's required and there is no effect that is sure to occur. So what is it that rhymes? What rhymes is for example, in looking at bull markets, and I've been involved in six, seven, eight major bull markets in my 50 years in this business, the things that recur, in my opinion, are a high level of optimism, a low level of risk aversion, and an excess of capital available for investment. These three things, if you think about it, constitute a pretty good recipe for a bull market. And in their absence, it's hard to imagine how we would have a bull market. So optimism, risk aversion, and capital availability. Asset prices are a function of two things. The fundamentals, the reality of the company, the property, the stock, whatever it might be, and then how those fundamentals are perceived through the filter of emotion or psychology. What is it that causes price to fluctuate on the upside? What is it that causes asset prices to overstate uh, their fundamentals and become precarious? And the answer is optimism. 
I sum it up as optimism. There are many factors, but clearly when, when uh, people are feeling good about the future, when they are believing favorable stories, when they are expecting more and more from companies, uh, these are the times when asset prices go high relative to intrinsic value, producing appreciation for the people who own the asset, but making the price precarious. In heated times, when the bidding is spirited, sometimes the price goes too high and the winner of that auction is actually a loser because he or she paid too much and signed on for too much risk at the reward of uh, too little return. We have to know when that's the case. I, I write often about what I call the seven worst words in the world. Too much money chasing too few deals. In other words, excessive capital availability. And when there's too much money in a market and people are too eager to put it to work, the bidding goes too high and the returns deteriorate, the risk rises, and the structures of the uh, thing that's up for sale uh, weakens. So let's talk about how these things interact together and what a typical cycle looks like. So let's say we're at a low. Maybe we've just come through a crash or a crisis or a correction and asset prices are low, the economy has been performing poorly, uh, most people are smarting from their previous losses. What happens? Eventually, yes. Eventually, there is improvement. The economy starts to strengthen. Companies start to report better earnings. And once the trend gets rolling enough, the media turn to investing, uh, to mentioning primarily favorable developments. If this goes on long enough, eventually, Investor expectations strengthen, optimism rises, asset prices rise. This causes people who have been holding assets to celebrate and buy more. Eventually, people who haven't been holding assets capitulate and finally give up and buy themselves. Everybody's a buyer. Not too many people are sellers because everybody feels favorably. That means asset prices strengthen even more, bringing more confidence into the markets and causing risk aversion uh, to evaporate. At this stage in the market, usually what people say is, I love risk bearing. Risk is a, my friend. The more risk you take, the more money you make. Bring it on. Eventually, the economy starts to perform less well. Company earnings don't surprise, they disappoint. Eventually, the media catch on, and now they start talking about negative developments, not positive ones. What happens? Investor expectations weaken. Psychology becomes more depressed. Now, prices are falling. People have losses, not gains. The people who have been holding are chastened and withdraw. Maybe they sell. The people who haven't been holding celebrate. They pat themselves on the back, but certainly they don't jump into the market. Now, risk aversion is rising, and people are saying, risk? Just another way to lose money. I'll never touch it again. And this is what happens at the bottom. The people who have not been, who have not been in the market certainly jump in and buy. This is the time when the anti-cyclical unemotional investor should turn aggressive. Not easy. Everybody is doing the opposite. Everybody's buying at the top because they feel good. Everybody's selling at the bottom because they're depressed. This is what makes tops and bottoms. Your job, to the extent you can do it, is to do the opposite. But you are subject to the same environmental influences as everybody else. How can you resist these things? Well, number one, you have to understand the role of emotion. You have to understand that fundamentals don't fluctuate that much. Emotion and psychology fluctuate much more. You have to understand the importance of being unemotional. Not easy. If you are 
as emotional as the typical investor, you will do the same things as the typical investor. That is to say, buy at the top, sell at the bottom, and certainly you will not outperform. You have to try to do better. How? By being unemotional, by hiring investor managers who are unemotional, by not tampering with the process. But we always did it with trepidation. We never said we're buying and we're 100% sure it's the right thing to do. We said we're buying and we think we're right. We buy some. Maybe it cheapens further. Maybe we buy more. By the way, one of the big mistakes you can make is to wait for the bottom. A lot of people say, I'm not going to buy. I'm not going to try to catch a falling knife. Rather, I'm going to wait until the dust settles and until the uncertainty is resolved. And guess what? When the uncertainty is resolved and the knife has stopped falling, the bargains are gone. You get the bargains during the decline when everybody else wants to get out and they want your help in enabling them to get out as the prices are cascading downward. In closing, we eventually have to get to the topic, where are we today? And there's a mixed message. This is not one of those times when we are extremely high and you must sell and ex or extremely low and must buy. We're in the middle ground someplace. There are factors favorable and unfavorable. But let me talk to you for a minute about the decision that has to be made. The key, as I said earlier, aggressive or defensive. Relative to your normal risk posture, should you be more aggressive? Should you have more assets and riskier assets? Or should you be defensive, has less assets and safer assets? That's really the key. And uh, I think that by enumerating the factors, we can get to an answer. But as I say, we're in middle ground today, so it is not an extreme or a compelling answer. But when I look at the environment, I see number one, we're in the 10th year of an economic recovery, and there has never been a US economic recovery of more than 10 years. So that says something about the probability of it continuing. There's no physical rule that I know of that says that no recovery can go on beyond the 10th anniversary. I'm pretty sure that this economic recovery will turn out to be the longest in history. So I would say that we are somewhere above the midpoint of the cycles. I would say that, uh, that uh, we, would, we should be more defensive and less aggressive, that we should worry more about losing money and worry less about missing opportunities. Last point. Even if we know where we are in the cycle, it doesn't say we know what's going to happen tomorrow or next week or next year. But it says something about the odds. So from any point in the cycle, the next move could be up or flat or down. And we don't know with certainty which one it is, but we know something about the probabilities. And I believe that the probabilities today are biased toward the downside. Not so bad that we shouldn't invest, but, but making it extremely important that we invest with caution. And Oak Tree today is applying a high degree of caution in everything it does. Uh, that's my answer to where we are today. I hope that's been helpful to you, and I hope to see you uh, in the near future again, hopefully not even by hologram.